G'day, Dil G'day, Dylan O'Donnell here. I've got a first light image for you from the Celestron 11 inch where I'm using the massive focal length and I've captured a galaxy. And to do this, I had to cheat because my gear really wasn't up to scratch. I don't have all the stuff that I need, so I just wanted to pump out a quick image. So in today's video, I'm gonna show you how to cheat at astrophotography. I'm gonna share those inside secrets on how you can cheat to get the best astrophotography images possible. I'll show you the image at the end, but for now, let's get into it. My name is Dylan O'Donnell, and you're watching Star Stuff. So normally in my videos I'm super up close like this because uh, my microphone has been on top of the camera uh, but I've got a new microphone now and I can walk around anywhere which is fantastic and now you don't have to look at my ugly face right up in the camera all the time. This video is sponsored by High Point Scientific. High Point Scientific are an American telescope vendor that fully support their products. They've got a full range of everything you need for your astronomy journey. So there really isn't any reason you shouldn't be using them if you're in America or Canada. Tell them I said hi. So the first tip I'd like to talk to you about is staying set up. Now, obviously I'm maximum cheating here. I have an observatory, all I have to do is go outside and turn it on. In fact, I haven't polar aligned since I set up the observatory a couple of months ago before the coronavirus lockdown began. But this is not something that you need an observatory to do. There's a lot of different tricks you can use to stay as set up as possible, including marking out the areas on your tripod so that you can just get the tripod out and you know it's roughly polar aligned straight away. You might mark this out on the deck or mark this out wherever you normally set up. Other astronomers like Astro Stace have a pier set up in the backyard. Again, this is super easy to just go out and mount your gear straight on and you can put markings to make sure you're roughly good to go. Uh, if you're lucky enough to be able to keep the mount where it is and just cover it up, uh, your mount might have a last alignment feature where you don't have to polar align again and again, and that's what I do. So that saves a lot of time. And it's not just that, you can also leave your image train set up. You might choose to leave your cameras and reducers and all the accessories and spaces all set up ready to go so that when you need it, you can just pull that out and it really reduces your setup time because you want to spend most time actually taking images, not fiddling this stuff. <laughs> Now the next astro cheat is simply spending lots of money. I know a lot of people go on about you know budget astro and you can get away with a little bit of equipment and get great results and for the most part that is true. You can do good things with very limited equipment. I don't know what to tell you, it really is and the more money you spend on it, the better your images will be. I'm not gonna sugarcoat this for you. It can get pretty pricey. Uh, if you gave Leonardo da Vinci an Etch-a-Sketch, he's gonna do great work on the Etch-a-Sketch, but it's still gonna look like an Etch-a-Sketch. If you give the guy uh, paints and watercolors and sketch pads and a morgue where he can cut open dead pregnant women to see the baby inside, he's gonna have a more spectacular kind of portfolio. And the same is true for astronomy. The more equipment and the better equipment you have and the more you're willing to invest in it, you're gonna get better results. It's a cheat, but it works. Now this next tip is something that beginners do all the time, but I've got to be honest, I did it <laughs> in this first light image I'm about to show you. Uh, there's no guiding on this, no guide scope, no off-axis guider. Uh, for this, I just used lucky imaging. I just decided to do really short exposures and not guide and just trust that the mount could do the job and it did, uh, but obviously at this focal length, I'm gonna get any little wind gust is gonna ruin the stars. So I had to take literally hundreds of images in order to get the few short exposures that I need where the stars were relatively round and sharp. Uh, so it's a cheat, but you can use lucky imaging for deep space and not guide. It's not gonna be the best results. You're not gonna be able to dither or anything like that. Guiding is definitely the way to go. But look, if you're a beginner or you're just looking to shortcut, and if you trust your mount, don't guide and see what you get. This telescope is way too much to handle for most people. 2800 millimeter focal length is huge. And really, the wider you can make your rig, the easier and more forgiving it's gonna be. If you can get a reducer on here, and I have one on order, to reduce this to F7 instead of F10, uh, you're gonna get better results. Just reducing in general is easier. The Rasas are at F2, and I've gotta say, they're really easy to use. 
honestly, using the RAS as an F2 feels like cheating. You are shooting super wide. Same for shooting Milky Way with the DSLR. It's really, really forgiving. You don't need to guide. You don't even need tracking. Uh, so if you can shoot wide field, the requirements for getting guiding and tracking and all of that really sort of fade away and you can start taking super short exposures and still getting great signal and great results. So shooting wide is definitely cheating, but there are some really big things here in the Southern Hemisphere. So it's an easy cheat. Now you've probably heard about binning, but you may or may not know what it does. Uh, binning basically allows you to multiply the signal that you get in your camera by sacrificing the resolution. Let me explain. Let's say that this is the camera chip. Whenever a photon comes in and hits one of these pixels, it registers a value on that pixel. Uh, what I can do is actually halve the size of the sensor by bidding. This is not to scale or whatever, but let's say this is two by two. So it essentially turns four pixels into one. So four pixels equals one pixel now. What we've done is quadrupled the signal. So now you get four times as much signal over these four pixels that have now been combined into one. If you're using three by three binning, then you'll get nine times the signal. If you use four by four binning, you'll get 16 times the signal. So it's a massive signal jump, but you are sacrificing the size of the image. So I used this trick for the last image and you know, normally I would release a 4K image to the public and this time I can't because I've binned three by three in this case, uh, which has reduced the image. So I was able to use those short exposures and get a really dim object looking nice and bright. Now this is something I see people doing all the time, especially beginners. Uh, if you've got your image and because you've been cheating and not guiding and everything looks a bit rough, you've got these, uh, you've got this color noise here, you've got bands, you've got dark patches, everything's looking a bit crap, uh, you can push the histogram. So if you go into levels here and push the black point, Ooh, everything looks a bit nicer. And a lot of people push the black point a lot, in, too far, in fact, I think. And, and yeah, you get this nice inky black space, but you also lose a lot of detail. There's a lot of little faint fuzzy galaxies in here that just sort of disappear. Now we don't see any of that yucky stuff anymore, but I think it really detracts from the image. I don't like doing this but it's something that I see out there a lot. Case in point, this is just a random image I've taken off Reddit. I'm sorry if it's <laughs> anyone who follows this channel, but let's look at the black point. You can see it's pulled hard up against the histogram here. So they've clipped data away out of their image. And if we pull it back, you can see there were numerous problems with this image in terms of the noise and the vignetting. It's not a flat field, but all of that goes away if you clip the histogram and push that black point in. Which leads me nicely to my next point, which is simply over-processing. You can use processing tools to really erase the errors in your image. I'm pushing noise reduction tools. I use Topaz AI for the noise reduction and it really compensates for uh, not having enough data. Uh, using sharpening tools, pushing the saturation, all of these things that really aren't great for the integrity of your processing, but if you just don't have good data, like what happened to me with the image I'm about to show you, then over-processing can really get you out of the bind. And my final tip has to simply be resize your image, downsampling. Now this is a huge image. I've downsampled to a pretty huge resolution um, already, but if I really wanted to hide uh, my flaws, I could just resize this down to 1024. That means no one can really see the uh, how bad my stars are because when you blow them up, they're all squares. It makes it harder to discern whether this is a good image or not. Uh, it's a good trick for posting to Instagram. It's not great for uh, getting great images. You're never gonna get these published in a magazine, but downsampling is also another trick you can use to just get a quick image out there. Now, I'm not saying you should do any of these things. In fact, you most certainly shouldn't. Uh, there are worse things in the world though. There are people who are taking, say, Hubble data, mixing it into their images. I can tell, and a lot of us can, so don't do it. Other things you probably should avoid is using the clone tool too much to get rid of real flaws in your image. But if you overdo this, you're actually faking space. And there are some examples where astrophotographers have completely 
basically forge the image. It's not the right thing to do. Now, if you are using these methods, you, you will end up with an image which is subpar. It's not best practice, but sometimes you just want an image. And in my case, I really wanted to get first light on this. Where was I? Don't use these trips to do bad astrophotography. Use them if you need to get out of a pinch and everything hasn't worked out the way you wanted it to. At least you'll get something. And with that, I present my first light image. As you can see, it's very, very large. This really dominated the field of view for the C11. And I don't want you to look too closely because I've used a lot of these cheats just to get through. There was no guiding, I binned. It's a really low resolution image. The stars look terrible. What the image does show though is the potential for this scope once I sort out everything. I still think this image looks really cool and if I'd have taken an image like this two years ago I would have been absolutely stoked. It is the best failed image I've ever taken I think and certainly the best image of the Sombrero Galaxy I've ever taken. This scope is going to be a lot of fun going forwards. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, be sure to check out the show's sponsor, High Point Scientific, especially if you need to spend a lot more money to get much better images. <laughs> hope things are treating you well during the pandemic and life is sort of getting back to normal. My name is Dylan O'Donnell. Remember, everything is meaningless and we're all going to die. <laughs> <laughs>